So today, in the spirit of Halloween, we're going to create the home of a lurking spider in its silky web. This is what you'll need. Some placemats or newspapers, silver paint, which I squeezed out already, a paintbrush, some woolen string, scissors, fake spiders, and wooden sticks, and some craft glue. So for the first step, we're going to grab our three wooden sticks. So a good thing to do is bunch our sticks together, get some silver paint, and then paint them all at the same time. All right, I have to separate them. And now let's set it aside to dry. So the wooden sticks have dried. Now it's time to get another wooden stick. So just add a dollop of glue onto the center of your wooden stick. And then place your second stick on top of your first stick, but on a slight diagonal. Now get some more glue. Grab your third stick and place it on top on a diagonal. You should end up having about six triangles. Now let's set this aside to dry. Now that the wooden sticks are all dry, we have our framework. So from here, we're going to start knitting and measure out about two meters string, snip it, tie a knot onto the center. And let's do a double knot and snip off the excess string. Great, we can start spinning our web. So we're gonna first wrap the string around each stick once. Make sure to space out the wool when you're doing this in order for it to look like a real spider web. Just keep going until you have string going up to the very end of the stick. I think I'm gonna stop here and just tie a knot. The web is done, time for the spider. Add a bit of glue onto the back of the spider and stick it on to the center of the web. And there you have it. So once it's dry, you can hang it wherever you like. Hi, my name is Hussein Sami, and I'm an artist. My earliest memories were drawing as a three-year-old. I never went anywhere without a pencil or a pad. I could engage in drawing for hours, and that would make me quite content. Sitting in front of the telly, Saturday mornings, just drawing, such an important part of my start. The work behind me is the matter of painting as a vivid projection onto the MCA building uh, down at Circuit Quay. The type of work that I do uh, as an artist is dealing with the ideas of painting and the structures behind that. So I collaborated with a Paris-based collective and we talked about the elements of painting, the canvas as a material, the ripping of the paint, splashing, pouring paint, throwing paint, and trying to translate that into a video projection. All these different sequences that have come together to form this animation I'm quite impatient as an artist. I don't like to spend a lot of time on work because of the quickness of its distribution as a liquid form. That process itself is what gets me excited about working in a, in a fast pace and a quick manner. So all art comes from somewhere. You can make art anywhere you go or wherever you want to. But I think for me, the studio is a really important space. A typical day in the studio just starts off with sitting. <laughs> just sitting in the space. 
thinking about the next work I want to engage in. Thinking is an important element, an important factor. Mistakes are quite an important element in what I do. Mistakes produce things unexpected. Often for me, they lead into different avenues of work and you, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. It's, it's such an important element in any process. If you make mistakes, never get down on yourself. Engage and understand that that's an important part of the process and you move on from there, I think. For me, it's more of a compulsion. It's something that I think about all the time. It's part of who I am, how I think, how I live. Being an artist is something that you are born to do. It's, it's something you live to do. To look at the work on the facade of the building, just the scale, the paint pouring down the building, it's pretty uh, impressive. I'm Nathan and I like to take photos and make films. Ready, set, tromo! I originally started wanting to be an actor, which kind of worked out because I was doing all these castings and getting little roles here and there and then all of a sudden um, this big audition came up for uh, Saturday Disney and I kind of did two other castings for other kids shows before that and didn't get them so I was kind of going, I'm an actor, not a presenter and I walked in there and I kind of went, I'm not going to get it, I'm just going to be myself. And I was myself in the casting and walked out of there and about two weeks later they're like, oh, hey, Nathan, um, guess what? You got the job. And I was like, what? Actually, I'm not going to lie to you, a little, OK, not one, but a couple of tears came out of my eye that day. <laughs> I remember the first time I was actually in a film and I was filming it as well. I got in front of the camera and they went, action and this was at high school and I literally went ha. and I froze and I thought to myself the one thing I want to do in the future is filmmaking and I can't even talk to a camera when they put the red light on so I was kind of like oh how am I going to do this so that was probably my first you know memory of you know filmmaking and stuff for myself and probably the worst at the same time <laughs> I'm singing, I'm singing, singing, singing. So I just love anything to do with the camera, you know, photography, filmmaking. I love just getting out there and just getting arty. We're making a miniature film set which mixes live action and basic special effects. The one thing I'm most proud of is that, you know, when I was growing up, I actually found it quite hard to read and write. For me, movies and filmmaking and photography was something that I could kind of go and do and not have to worry about people thinking that, you know, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I kind of was self-taught and met a lot of people along the way that have taught me certain things about different parts of it, from like presenting, meeting other bigger presenters who were kind of, you know, taking me under their wing. And then when I got more into, like, the filmmaking and photography side, there's a couple of guys on our crew here who actually have helped me out a heap. But then I found something I really loved, and that was filmmaking and photography. And I just tried so hard, and now I'm here today doing this for, as a job. Jump! When I'm not taking photos or filming something, I'm writing these days. I, I like to write scripts, and I also like to go surfing. I go for a surf, sit out there, everything goes away. I just have fun, I come back, and then all of a sudden, I've got ideas. The biggest mistake I ever made, okay, I got up really early one morning, I heard there was gonna be an amazing sunrise, and I'm all set up, I took all these beautiful shots, went home and went to put it onto my computer, and accidentally pressed delete. And, yeah, about three hours of work, gone. But the good thing is, I actually got to enjoy it visually with my eyes when I was down there, so it's still up here, which counts. 
When I was really first started getting into it, my biggest, biggest supporter would have been my nan. Love you, nan. Some advice I wish I'd been told when I was younger would have to be that, just relax. You can just chill, enjoy what you're doing, and have fun while you're doing it. And cut! Now that's gonna make for some beautiful slow-mo, yeah! Oh, no! <laughs> Taking photos and videos of your holidays can be so much fun, so I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on how to make a sweet holiday scrapbook, which will make your friends and family feel like they're actually there with you. Now, what you're going to need is, of course, a camera. It could be a big one like this, or it could just be your mobile. Now, what else you're gonna need is, of course, a holiday. That's why I'm here in Tasmania, traveling all around. I'm actually in Ross at the moment, because I heard there was a beautiful bridge like this one. So I thought I had to get a photo of it. Okay, here we go. So, line it up. Oh, look at that, and... Oh, the battery's flat. I'll just take it on my phone then. <laughs> oh, yeah, number one tip, just make sure that you charge both devices. Take photos of street signs and landmark signs because when you get home and you cut it all together, you might forget that that bridge there is actually called the Ross Bridge, which was built in 1836. It's a really old bridge. It's beautiful though. Travelling shots are a great way to break up your talking to camera shots and get you from one location to the next. All you have to do is sit back, hold onto your action camera and just speed it up later on. Let's go. I'm just gonna put my seatbelt on. Safety first, you know. Okay, and let's go. It's always a good idea to film things you're doing for the first time, you know, things that might excite you or scare you. And I'm about to get into this, aren't I? So just jump, jump in. Ah. Grab the pole. Turn and sit. There you go. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, for that. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs> oh, it's really hot. Oh, my God. Ooh. Humans are meant to be on the ground. Take a lot of short talking pieces of camera so your friends know what you're doing, where you are, and how you're feeling. Just like this. I'm in the middle of Hobart. This is Franklin Square. That's actually Franklin right there. And it is freezing and really early in the morning, but I'm having so much fun. <sighs> Look at that, beautiful. And remember, keep an eye out for local wildlife. Hey, buddy, stay your cheese. Stay, stay still. <laughs> delete, 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 delete photos as you go. You know the ones that might be a little bit out of focus or the ones you know you're not going to use? Like this one right here, wow. When you get home, it'll make your holiday scrapbook a lot easier to cut together. And it only takes about five or 10 minutes at the end of the day. Wow, I am definitely not keeping that one. Ugh, delete. And there you go, my final shot for my Tasmanian holiday scrapbook. Hope you guys like it. break your favourite piece of jewellery? Well, don't throw it away, because I'm going to show you how to turn your favourite piece of bling into something spectacular. So for this project, you're going to need a black or a plain phone case, super glue, wire cutters, an old necklace or a couple of necklaces, some little mosaic squares, another old necklace. Don't worry if you can't find any of these things at home, because you can rummage around and find old bits of toys, broken hair clips, keychains. Just make sure you check with an adult before you start pulling it apart. Start by laying out some pieces, measuring out the length you need, and then very carefully, using your wire cutters, cut exactly to size. Now, I'm doing this on a phone case, but you can also do it on a tablet or, you know, a book cover. Okay, everything's cut, so I need to slowly work 
gluing each piece down right to left. Starting from the bottom and working my way up, I'm going to do a crisscross pattern with the black and the pink mosaic squares. And now for the finishing touch, I'm going to glue this black bow to the top left corner. But this is your phone case, so make it as colourful or as out there as you like. Okay, we're all done. And now you just have to let everything dry overnight. <laughs> okay, bye. Uh, I'd probably buy a miniature jet, a certain style, but I'm not sure. Like I could do a massive tapestry, throw paint through the engines and splat it onto the art. There are some paintings that have like five to 10 canvases. So I could have like a massive painting with a lot of canvases. I would want to create a pizza robot thingy. And then I would, and then you, you can create something and then we'll try and combine them together. To I would want to create an ice cream and it was gigantic, but it was made out of paintballs. It could be a pizza shaped ice cream made out of paintballs. Yeah. With robotic arms and robotic legs. I'd spend it on a really miniature version of the Mona Lisa. And you'd have to get the most miniature brushes you could ever find. Terrariums are a living, breathing miniature oasis made for small plants and animals. And I'm going to show you how to make your very own. So, you will need rainwater, a glass bowl, natural rocks, soil, moss, coloured rocks, charcoal, your succulents, a spade, some gardening gloves, and a mask. And dinosaurs. Arr. So, let's get started. We'll grab our glass bowl and we'll first put in our natural rocks. So, I'll put a small handful in the bottom, cover it all. And then I'm going to put some coloured rocks so you can choose whatever colour you like. I'm going to choose green because that's my favourite. And we'll just handful those in. I might just pour it in actually. There we go. And I'll just spread it around. So the rocks down the bottom of the bowl act as a drainage system so that the water has somewhere to go. So now we are going to put our charcoal. You only need a thin layer of charcoal, so don't get too crazy. Spread that around. I think that's pretty good. Now I'm going to add my soil. I'm using organic soil. Just to be safe, I'm going to use my gloves, my mask and a spade. So now that we have our soil in, we can plant our succulents. So I took these from my garden. They're all the little babies of the big ones. They're so cute. So all I'll do is I'll use my finger to make a hole on the side somewhere and I'll go ahead and plant him. Only about the tip of your finger, so about probably that much. So I'm going to choose some baby ones now. So I'm this little guy, he is super cute. He doesn't have any roots, but he will grow his own roots if you plant him in the soil. So I'm going to pop him in. We'll just press around the succulent slightly, just so that they sit nice inside the soil. So now I'm going to add my moss. Now remember, moss is optional, so if you don't have any, that's okay. But if you do want to put it, you'll find it anywhere. I found this at the front of my house and I just dug it up. So I broke it off in pieces because it's very hard to pick it up any bigger than this. So I'll just give you a look. And I'm just gonna pop it on top. There you go. Put as much as I like. Moss will probably spread over time, so I wouldn't worry too much at the beginning. I think that looks pretty good. So now we can add our big rocks, so anything decorative. So I've picked these, which you can find in a lot of your garden, or you can buy them. So I'm only gonna put three big rocks, 
because we're going to add some coloured rocks and our dinosaurs and we don't want to overcrowd it. I'm going to add some red rocks around the sides. Now I'm going to add some blue rocks. Now remember, all of these rocks is optional. So if you don't have them, that's okay. Sometimes it's nice just to find things that you have already in your garden. I think that looks pretty cool. Now, to add our dinosaurs. So, let's see. One, two, three. Terrariums really love rainwater. If you don't have rainwater, you can use tap water. But next time, try and catch that rainwater. So I'm gonna go ahead and give my new terrarium a little spritz. You don't have to water them every day. Every couple of days is more than enough. Now this is one awesome terrarium, fit for a T-Rex or a Tinkerbell. You can pop them on your homework desk or your windowsill. Just make sure that if you do pop them on your windowsill that it's not in direct sunlight as the little succulents will burn.